Thanks everyone for your um, comments in the chat. And I hope that um, if you have questions, please, we were really excited to talk um, about and hear your thoughts, talk about what you thought of the video and um, everything that we presented to you. Um, and we're gonna, we're gonna talk a little bit more about our process for getting here. Um, but please put your stuff in the Q and I and we will answer. Yeah. We have, there's a lot more material that we have that we in our heads that we just can't can't get into the video. Um, get the slides. All right. So, um, do you want me to do you want to do this one? Yeah. So, um, Neil and I, when we well, when Neil was working on Reno. And um, he was talking about um, his experience in the DC archives. And I went and looked with him and the two of us decided that some adv advocacy needed to be done. So we started the DC archives advocates group. Um, uh, so that's, you know, that's us. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. But um, this project, as we said before, took us I think it was like three and a half years. Three and a half years think yeah. three, but I think it was more than that. It feels like forever. Yeah. Um, we visited tons and tons of archives. Um, we went. We, visit, we what, visited the Maryland State Archives, Howard, the National Archives, Montgomery County Historical Society, Chivity Historical Society, the Rockville Public Library. Um, right. Yep. The DC Archives. DC Archives. We went to every single suburb that we mentioned in this video. So we know what they look like now. Um, we, and some that, that we didn't even mention. <laughs> no. um, we read hundreds of second or secondary sources between books and articles, um, reports. Um, we actually have written a paper on this, which is at this point a draft and it's about 70 pages long and has 300 plus footnotes. Um, so you can imagine all the sources that are contained in there. Um, We're getting it ready for publication in an academic public publication. Um, and, and really that's for those, I'm no, I know there are historians, professional historians um, in the audience, but um, for those of you who aren't familiar, like that is baseline for primary research of something like this, um, where you're starting from scratch. And, um, and so we really got a feel for what it's like to do our primary archival research um, and what archives are supposed to be like and what they're supposed to look like. Um, there's no way that we could have done this without archives. Yeah. Um, the, so yeah, the Belmont Syndicate, sorry, uh, the Belmont Syndicate, you know, so if we look at these, um, um, you look at people like, like we talked about the four men here, I mean, we had to piece this together from a lot of different sources. And, you know, if it was a more, more well-known person, such as the developers of Roland Park um, or Francis Newlands, I mean, there's lots of, there's lots of very clear information, but even like the description of Satterwhite right there, uh, and all that information and, the, and what we read uh, over the slide is, is kind of, it's like a Frankenstein patchwork of research sources, you know, you know, the tighter, the tighter we can give you the information, uh, means more research. So if you look at this, uh, no single source told us every single thing we needed. Um, and, you know, we went through Ancestry.com, uh, federal records. Um, Ancestry.com is it's like marriage, birth, death, military records. Uh, there's their high, their college yearbooks uh, was a source. There were periodic Black history uh, discussions, particularly from Michelle Dumas, who was very important in the appointment, the uh, appointment of Mordecai White Johnson. Um, to Howard University, he had a very interesting afterlife. Um, and uh, so I mean, at the end of the day, like the Satterwhite bio is one of the simpler ones that has 10 sources, right? So it's like nine sources to establish his, uh, his economic or his background. And then the discussion, how much he was in, he invested in Belmont uh, was in the contract. So that's, that's the kind of work that we're trying to piece, we're required to piece together to give a compelling story. And um, so, um... You know the the legal analysis behind this. That's how I got pulled into this. Um, Neil was talking about what he. So I think maybe it it'd be helpful to say that Neil 
um, found this in a mention um, in Kim Protho Williams paper. And do you want to correct? Me? Yeah, no, actually, yeah, it's just sort of, um, I, you know, I've been, I, so I grew up in Tenley Town and, and I, had, I had known this story for a long time. Um, Tenley Town is a neighborhood in DC for those who are not from DC. Um, and it's just down the street from Belmont. But I had, I had learned, I'd, you know, I'd been, I'd actually heard at some point a rumor about this, that there was a, a settlement for like black servants that were agricultural workers that was supposed to be set up where Friendship Heights was. And, you know, I, I never really investigated it. Uh, but I began researching, when I began researching the Reno community, um, I began researching this, this primary protagonist who was this man named James Neal, who was a, a well, you know him now. Uh, but at the time, it just seemed kind of this, this civil rights uh, agitator uh, who was coming in and defending this uh, relatively poor African-American community from being uh, cleared off the map. And he, uh, I, you know, just kind of went through uh, the website Chronicling America, which is a, a digitized uh, newspaper database from, uh, uh, from the Library of Congress, the National Endowment for the Humanities, just kind of plugging in his name, seeing what came up. And uh, that uh, the headline you saw that said Belmont Issue Stirs Realty World was actually what came up. And I actually like laughed out loud because it was again, it was this rumor that I had heard. Um, and here enough, it wasn't just that it wasn't just that um, um, that it existed, but that James Neal was part of it, that he had he had he had, had two run ins with the Chevy Chase Land Company, um, which is kind of kind of remarkable. And subsequently, uh, what we've learned essentially is that uh, some degree his involvement in Reno seems to actually have come out of his attempts to build a black suburb in Chevy Chase. Um, and uh, however, as Kim was suggesting, uh, I didn't have the legal understanding to, I did, there was a, in addition to just being a lot of work um, and, and Kim having a, a, a legal background and then also uh, I think a better sense of uh, say the African-American culture, African-American culture in DC before 1900, because uh, I'd done a lot of research on the twenties um, she had a little bit better before 1900. So uh, I was, we were talking about it and she, we decided it would be a great project to do together. And Neil had already gone and taken images. So this is a pile from the, Mar this is Maryland State Ar Archives, right? Yes. Yeah, of one of the court cases um, that we spoke about. And Neil had already started to take photos of the, and make images of these documents. And um, so we went back and got all of it. And that's sort of how I got pulled into this. And I would say that the legal analysis um, is still not complete um, because it's based on legal practice and, and laws that don't exist anymore. It's not how we function. Um, and I see some questions popping up about that. So we'll, we can get into that in a little bit more depth in the Q&A, but um, it, it, it's basically like not just slogging through um finding this stuff but actually trying to figure out what it's saying um and that's a super complicated portion of this um but that's just a tiny tiny percentage of the documents that we went through in the legal, legal cases that is half of case two three three four and so this and is the maryland state archives look how pretty um lovely critical regionalists building from the 1980s, a little, all of our Alto influence. It's, oh. and, and more, but more importantly, the staff is very nice. And we were trying to find photographs for this presentation of when we were there to see if we could show, this just came from the internet somewhere, but- oh, I uh, took this photo. Oh, you did? I took this photo. Sorry, I misunderstood. <laughs> I thought we couldn't find photos, but it's, you know, normally when you check, when you go into a professional archive, you have to put your stuff in a locker. You're not allowed to bring anything else in. Um, and you can only use a pencil, you have to sit at the desk, they bring you the files you call, you have no access to look at anything other than what they give you. Um, so this is like a beautiful archives experience. And then this is the DC archives. Um, this is the exterior, obviously. Yeah. In yes, the court. It's DC archives is a nailer court. It's a converted former stable and garage. Um, as you can see, it's had very severe water problems on the on the facade. Um, it's not good. Uh, it's actually, if you can believe this, worse inside. Do you wanna? Yeah. Um, so. 
so what you can see is um, there's, you know, it's not particularly well taken care of. It was built as a temporary solution when DC got home rule, uh, actually a little later in the 80s, uh, to consolidate a lot of documents. Of course, that, that, that has only grown. Um, and it really, it was neglected for about uh, 20 years. Um, they've started taking better, DC started taking better care of it, um, like maybe five, 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 six years ago. Um, and finally, uh, we're able to have it put in better shape. But I mean, uh, what you can see in this photograph, um, these are records. These are the next photograph. No, I think I think he's right. Oh, okay. uh, well, you know, it, it's these are um, kind of these um, all these all these documents that are incredibly uh, un unprocessed. This, uh, you know, you have documents that in the middle of the room, you're sort of sitting in a space. Um, uh, that, you know, whereas in Maryland State Archives, you're, you go into a special reading room that's secure and the documents, you don't touch any document that you don't actually request and there's very clear accountability. Um, there is no reading room in this, you, so you actually access it in the middle of the archival floor, which is also, a, uh, which has records in it, which has uh, circulation for other things. There's a gigantic elevator that is a massive fire hazard. Um, the desks are, are, are all disorganized. You can see these boxes are not processed. Um, and this actually, this, this set of boxes has to do with the works progress or public works administration uh, operations during the New Deal in DC. And it's all these kind of lives about, um, uh, from, from everything from, you know, the, the life of, of the, the Reno community um, to uh, stuff which is in a file called the engineer department file, which is kind of a public works file. Um, and then as well as to people like um, Amelia Heyrich, uh, we found some letters from uh, the wife of Christian Heyrich, uh, who was, uh, who of course is the Kimberly's, Kim's Museum. Um, there's lots of stuff about nightlife, built environment parks, uh, the 1968 riots, uh, all these, um, the building permits, uh, marriage, uh, death records that are um, just kind of there. And quite frankly, there's just a lot of stuff we don't know what's there. Like it just has never been processed. So nobody knows what um, is in it. And as a result, nobody knows what stories are in it. No one knows how many other things like Belmont. And when we talk are, about do, um, archival documents or archival records not being processed, that means that a box might be, it might be like the kind of file box that you have in an office filled with documents that are over a hundred years old with their original paper clips and staples and other, they're folded up. And so they've disintegrated and, and the, the metal has started to corrode the paper and they're just in a very terrible physical state and they've not been stabilized, which means they've not been, uh, you know, that stuff hasn't been taken off of them. They haven't been put in acid free containers that will prevent them from continuing to decay and that they haven't been um, processed in any way to, to be able to find them. There's no finding aid. So a lot of times when you go, like you use a card catalog at a library, there's um, mechanisms for you to find things in the archives. In the DC archives, a lot of that stuff has not been done. I would say the majority of that has not been done. Um, and these are uh, the most, this is the biggest history collection, um, DC history collection that exists. So anyone who wanted to do research, like we don't even know if a bunch of stuff related to Belmont is in the DC archives because there's practically no way to really figure that out. So if you like, if you're interested in Belmont, it's, it's important to stay involved. Um, we've, there's actually a council oversight hearing um, on Friday. Um, again, story again, stories like Belmont are, are, the evidence for them is preserved in the DC archives. We, I'm sure of it. Um, because I've just seen some, I've just seen some incredible, incredible things that just had to pass over because they didn't have time because it's the access is so limited. Um, so what we'd say, you, you can say, we'd really appreciate if you, uh, if you're a DC resident, you've sent a, a message to the, to the council. Um, you can see right on screen, uh, and I think we'll have it in the chat, uh, the information that the, just to send an email to the, the housing committee of the DC council, for whatever reason, now, now uh, oversees it. Um, so I hope you can, uh, to do that, if you take a photograph of the screen, it will take it to, if you take a photograph of the screen, uh, that QR code will take you to um, a website that will give you more clear instructions if you're interested in doing that. Um, and we hope, uh, we hope that in, in, you know, we'll be discovering things like this once the, once the DC archives is stabilized. So now I think we're entering the Q&A portion of the yes. program. Perfect. Um, so okay. many good questions. 
All right. Um, so maybe what we can do is I'll, I can throw you a question, Neil, and then you can throw me a question based on what Sure, that sounds great. Okay. Um, so Neil, let's see. Do you want to? I can answer some of Sarah's questions. Yeah. Okay. So Sarah Schoenfeld, um, who knows a lot about this. Yeah. Uh, she asked, "Can you repeat or elaborate on how the non-use of racial covenants on the non-use of racial co covenants elsewhere, and how the non-use of racial covenants in Roland Park influenced Newlands not to use them? He did use them in Forest Hills, she believes." Right. Uh, so yeah, Sarah, I think Sarah makes a great point, which is um, that, uh, but in points, it, what's, what you really need to sort of think about is, uh, uh, um, you know, the, the span that racial covenants were used and that there, there are different kinds, and there are different ways of, of, uh, of doing it. Um, but the classic, the classic one that's just a simple ban on African American, African Americans or other racial groups um, was, was only completely in the clear legally uh, between 1926 and 1948. That, that was when they were upheld in a court case actually related to DC as constitutional, and then um, uh, overturned as, as, as unconstitutional and against the 14th Amendment um, in 1948. So uh, when we, uh, but nevertheless, they, they persisted outside of that. They were used as a racial signaling tool afterwards. Um, plenty of people just put them in the covenants to make a point, even though they couldn't be enforced in court. Um, and they certainly had a, a legacy that existed, like uh, Kim said in the video, as early as the 1840s. So famously, um, what's now Anacostia, called Uniontown, had um, racial covenants. And I think actually Mara Cherkaski gave us one of those uh, comments, She's, uh, Sarah, Sarah Schoenfeld's partner. Um, but what we know is that in the, as racial covenants were being, uh, starting to be deployed in the United States in the 1890s, um, we don't, we, it seems like they, we step back. I mean, it seems like they were kind of after the Fourteenth Amendment. It seems kind of like racial covenants were seen as suspect, and no one really wanted to go in on them. Uh, but by the 1890s, um, they had started to be brought back into the uh, the D.C. areas from from California, primarily. Um, and at the same time, it's it does seem a little bit uneven uh, in the way that they're applied. So some people seem to have no trouble using them. Sarah mentions uh, in another question something called the U.S. Realty Corporation, um, which developed Congress Heights and Randall Highlands and a bunch of other areas over there and, and had a more uh, middle class uh, market that it was developed. Um, you know, they, they were very big users of racial covenants. Um, the, uh, they were in, in very early in the 1890s, at, at least. So um, it, it may be something more that it, there's sort of a tension is because people don't necessarily give away their secrets. We do know that um, Roland Park did not use them. We had, I mean, there's very clear documentary evidence and uh, there's a book called How the Suburbs Were Segregated by a woman named Paige Glotzer that goes into great detail about that. Um, and uh, they seem to have come down on, on the opinion that, that it, was, it, was, it was a legal risk. As far as we know, Francis Newlands did not ever have contact uh, with uh, the Roland Park Company. I've looked through their records in, uh, in, in, at Johns Hopkins University. Um, but um, uh, there's, it's, it's sort of a, a thing that had ambiguous, ambiguous place for a very long time. However, as Sarah pointed out, by the, by the 1920s, uh, they, become a very, they become much more standardized. Even, even as early as the 1910s, they're starting to become more common. And then particularly when racial, the Baltimore style racial zoning that we talked about, the, the apartheid style zoning, when that was invalidated in, 19, in 1917 in a Supreme Court case, um, that racial covenants became the more the sort of default way of, of, of achieving segregation. Um, they were made uh, standardized uh, as real, for, by realtors in 1924. Um, and then again, up, upheld, um, upheld in uh, the Supreme Court in 1926. So the Chevy Chase Land Company did, I believe, start using them in, starting with Chevy Chase Section 5. And then uh, Sarah says uh, Forest Hills, which is in the DC side of the Chevy Chase Land Company's holdings, uh, was done. Uh, and I believe, um, uh, I don't know, I, I, don't, I don't know, I've never looked at um, um, the, my house, my parents' house, which, is a, which was developed by the Chevy Chase Land Company to see whether they have a covenant. But um, 
it's sort of across across the way from friendship. Sorry, from uh, forced tales. So it's 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 a it's not a it's not a linear story. I mean, I, I guess I realized that was kind of a lengthy description, but um, you have to understand that you know the legal norms changed, things became clear, people took risks, and other people reaped the risks. That makes sense. Um, so then, uh, go ahead. No, go ahead. Um, so do you want to answer the question about uh, planning, uh, whether who would have designed the homes for these neighborhoods? For yeah. Belmont neighborhood? Belmont, yes, I think is what they mean. I think that at that point, there were no um, homes that had even gotten that far because yeah. the deeds were never released to these people. Um, I feel like you have a more, you have something in your head about more extensive than that. Sure. I mean, uh, I guess well, I would just say that, you know, the, there were black, there certainly were black architects. Um, I mean, I don't know what sufficient number is if by all accounts, uh, early black architects were starving for work. Um, Sidney Pittman certainly designed a number of houses in Fairmont Heights before he kind of went off the deep end. Um, and um, otherwise, uh, I mean, the kind of what Kim was implying is that um, generally when they sold land, you know, we had this idea that you buy you, a home builder subdivides the land, builds the streets, builds the land. Um, Chevy Chase was unusual in that they actually provided streets and utilities uh, in their developments. But um, most subdivisions really, they just, you just bought the land. They created the legal property. They created, they surveyed it and subdivided it. And that was it. Um, so you were on, your, on the hook to buy the house yourself. And the house was usually uh, several times more expensive than the rest of the, um, the rest of the property. Um, so that, so that, so the answer is, um, yes, there were, there were certainly, um, uh, black architects and, uh, uh who, who were designing homes when people had them. I want to talk about this question about the deeds of trust. Absolutely. Please. <laughs> um, so Jim Douglas asked in the chat, um, for us to talk a, a bit about more about the deeds of trust. How is this different from a traditional mortgage? How does a lender not provide a release? Um, and I think that, you know, we're so used to the mortgage industry being such a standardized thing that there are so many laws protecting. I mean, there's still such a mess um, within our system, but um, today we are much more regulated, so much more re heavily regulated than um, this was back in 1906. Um, and uh, most people didn't have mortgages at the time, and it wasn't really, it was sort of like the Wild West, as were um, chains of deed titles. So I think that, you know, all of the stuff that we can enjoy today, like um, titles, like having a title search done on your property before you do something is standardized because of the way things used to be. Um, and in this case, um, from our research, the, the deed of trust seem to only really be used by people with immense amounts of wealth, like the Chevy Chase Land Company as a mechanism. When they were attaching the deed of trust um, to the transaction, they were sort of um, private mortgaging it off to a developer to try to sell the, the parcels of land um, so that they can just get paid. It was like an investment scheme. And I think that, um, it's unclear to us whether they knew that it had other protective benefits potentially, but in this case, it, it did it, and as far as they were concerned because when um, people that they were didn't want to have be invested in the property were it, tried to, they were able to basically sue them into oblivion. And that's really what happened at the end of the day. Um, so, you know, when you don't have a lot of protections and then you go to court against a monolith company um, with a lot of sophistication, even if you are sophisticated, I think um, like it's not that surprising in the, end, in the end that they were able to push them back um, through legal means. So do you have anything to add, Neil? Well, yeah, I would just say that um, a lot of the, a lot of the, uh, uh, the way it, 
mortgages seem to be relatively rare as a, as a financing mechanism at this point. We, we haven't really found that many. Um, much more, most, uh, because the land was bought without the house, uh, a lot of stuff is um, done on contract. So people would have installment plans on the property. Uh, because in, in the same way that you know, contract buying, if you, if you know history of, of racial discrimination in housing is seen as this very evil practice. And, and the reason is because people would move in to the house and make it their own and be paying, um, paying for the property like rent, essentially, re essentially rent, but never actually gain ownership of the house until they had fully paid it off. Um, so that obviously is quite precarious and, and, was, and was only one of the only ways that uh, African Americans could afford to finance their houses. Um, when you're just talking about land and you live somewhere else, that practice seems to have been the practice of contract selling and just installment plans. And you only get the, the land when it's sold, when you close, uh, when you finish paying off. Um, that's, uh, that seems to be more widespread at this time. Kim, do you want to take the question about uh, uh, that Rhea had about uh, whether there are any descendants uh, around? Do, you, do we want to talk about that? Well, we yeah. Well, we don't have to talk about um, any specific descendants, but we can. There uh, are yeah. So there are um, descendants around. Um, some of why we are doing this and trying to make it public is to see if anybody forward as descendants of the lot buyers because we have very little information um, I mean we have like some sketches of them some were some, some were in the newspapers a lot more than others but we have not really um, been able to identify anyone who lives in the DC area now that was that was descended from them um, Right. Yes. I mean, that's that's kind of the question about what, what we're trying to do here. So, um, let's identify them. Um, so I have a question from uh, um, Sam Hanapel. Um, you know, does the the Chevy Historical Society have access to the, C the Chevy Chase Land Company archives? Um, and we can answer a couple other questions about the Chevy Chase Land Company's relationship to this talk, this re essay. Um, they they do not have any have not had any participation. The Chevy Chase Historical Society has 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 access to our paper. Um, what uh, Tim is referring to is, the, is that the Chevy Chase Historical Society, I believe, has a, is either indexed or um, uh, the records kept, kept by the Chevy Chase Land Company, which still exists and is still owned by the same family. In fact, their headquarters is actually in the Belmont site. Um, they, uh, they have, have a collection of, of documents. Um, it's not really clear what they have and I've never been able to access it. And I, I don't, um, obviously we'd like to see what's there. Um, I, I've heard it's more, has, has more to do with land records uh, than, than any kind of operations records, which is what we'd expect. Um, and quite frankly, it's a bit tricky to, to get that kind of information. Um, let's see. Scrolling through. I mean, do you want to talk a little bit more about Reno? Because we have a question, did the Belmont Syndicate end up building anywhere else in the DC area? It's a great question. Um, so what we know is that um, there, there's a particular, a couple a uh, couple people who actually were involved in, in this project that were also involved in Reno. So um, the uh, uh, what we sort of, what we kind of sense is there's um, some of the more active members of the Reno community at its peak um, actually were lot buyers. There's a man named Z Zachariah T. Thomas who bought lots um, in, in, uh, in, who bought a lot in, in Belmont and subsequently moved uh, with his family, subsequently was actually able to buy and purchase uh, several lots in Reno and build a relatively nice house. Um, he, became the director of its Citizens Association, uh, or its, yes, it was called the Citizens Association um, at the time, and was able to build, a, a, get, a lot of, get a lot of investments in, in the neighborhood, which at the time was still very rural. So a lot of the, a lot of the plumbing hooks up, hookups, the electricity, um, some activity on schools uh, was actually uh, led by him. Um, of course, James Neal uh, also seems to have started to do to speculate. He, he and uh, his brother Louis Neal, who also were um, owners of, who also had bought in Reno, uh, seem to have bought a number of lots in. Sorry, 
they were owners in Belmont. They seem to have uh, bought a lot of lots in, um, in Reno as well. And it seems like some of their interest actually comes out of more of attempting to build uh, either, either for profit or for themselves uh, housing there and trying to possibly, um, evidence is very thin now, but it seems possible that they were trying to do what they wanted to do in Reno or in Belmont in Reno, that Reno would become the affluent of the American community. Um, the, uh, um, there also was a man named Thomas Johnson, who was also a, a, a purchaser for, of lots in Belmont, who was, uh, later became one of James Neal's close friends and close associates um, and, and lived in that, uh, um, and lived in Reno as well. Um, yeah, uh, if in the chat, Sarah Schoenfeld has posted her and uh, her and Mara Cherkasky's incredible project of documenting um, um, uh, documenting racial covenants around DC. Uh, they're actually looking for volunteers uh, to do some research on that. Um, so, um, uh, if you click that link, if you're really interested in, in uncovering sort of the stories very locally, uh, I think it's a great project to be involved in, and the work is great. Um, Mr. Pelly asks us if we had any good stories about any of the other suburbs. Do you have any good stories about any of the suburbs? I mean, I'm obsessed with Maggie Lena Walker from Richmond, um, who um, her Frederick Douglass court was just a couple of streets and there are still some of the original houses there. Um, but she was an amazing woman and she there's a National Park Service site in Richmond that was her home in Jackson Ward. And they just found, so she, had, she started a bank. She was um, just this amazing woman. Um, they just found a couple years ago, boxes and boxes of, of her archives in an, um, attic. in an attic. And the National Park Service, I think last month just acquired them. So that, that will be a really rich resource um, going forward for people to research and learn about what she was doing in, you know, a, a wealth of um, industries. But um, even if you're at all interested in um, this kind of history, I think that you should go to Maggie Lena Walker's house. It's, yeah, it's, it's very more cool. intact than the Hyrick house. I think it's pretty incredible. I recommend it. Um, so Chris, Chris, Christopher has asked, uh, do you think it was a class distinction at first uh, in terms of, I think he's, I think Chris is, Christopher is talking about um, uh, the risks of being outwardly segregationist. I, I think there's, there seems to be some, um, there seems to be some element to that. Um, uh, we, we do, that, that's, it's a it's just hard to tell. I don't think we've ever found a, a quite a, precisely a smoking gun on, on why that distinction we've made. You know, in Capitol Heights, the one that had, that was very, very proudly uh, uh, whites only, I, mean, I think more so than almost any other um, subdivision I've ever seen, um, was specifically very affordable, a very working class. Um, and you also notice they didn't have any building restrictions. They, there's that ad shed said no building restrictions. And that's what they're talking about the Chevy Chase land company's, you know, $5,000 requirement. You have to build a $5,000 house on this land. And you can only do certain things on this land. Um, so the covenant, uh, so Capitol Heights did not have those, uh, but it did have a, a racial covenant, right? So the, clearly they're trying to, to create uh, some kind of space and possibly also, um, um, you know, buy into the class, the class pa power of being white as opposed to, as opposed to being, uh, even if you're poor, I, I can certainly see that kind of thing happening, but I, we just don't have that much, we haven't found the evidence for that. Tim Hannibal asked, where, where do we find the original documents with the names of the buyers? A lot of the um, of that comes from, where all of those in particular come as um, exhibits to the court cases. So they were entered into evidence as part of the court cases. So luckily copies of them existed um, in the Maryland State Archives. Um, a lot of the documents that we used are from those court cases. Um, some of the other deeds we had to hunt for. Neil really hunted for them. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of a lot of mining that took 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 place to do. Um, spent a lot of time on on um, uh, Maryland Maryland land records. 
so again, you know, someone someone asked the chat why why we're we talking about the DC archives for this, and the answer is first off that uh, whereas Maryland's Maryland's land records are digitized back to like the 1600s um, to the original land patents, and DCs are only uh, digitized up into the 1920s, and they won't allow bulk access to the access to the ones that they have digitized as well. Um, and again, second thing is so that's the kind of access. So again, the question is if you like this this story, this is. Um, if this is something that speaks to you, there's, there are probably more stories waiting to be uncovered in the documents um, at the DC archives that simply because it hasn't been processed yet. Also, Neil and I live in DC. So for us, it's a, and Neil is from, born, born and raised here. I've been here for 10 years and um, we, every day of my job, focus on DC history. So for us, um, the records of DC history are extremely important to preserve and are directly connected to everything right outside the, the bounds of the district. So um, if you live in one of the suburbs of Washington, DC, we also think you should be concerned about the status of the DC archives. All right. Any any other questions? Or um, I mean, I'm glad I'm glad this is speaking. The the seeing. I, I think Tim Tim Hanapel has commented that like you know he thinks that it's great that this stuff is. Uh, um, all we have all these handwritten documents and represent them. I I mean I agree. I think it's very cool to see the the hands, um, see that you know literally the hands that sort of reaching out across time and and you know I don't I don't think you can see people's personalities, but it's really great uh, to have that kind of contact with with a life that. You never had contact, never it passed you by completely. Um, so we have a new question. So we were. So Megan, that's a good question. Do you want, do, I can't answer that. Um, this is about the zoning, I'll answer it. Um, the, I, I, that, uh, Megan Walsh asked a question that says, there are issues that affect zoning. Knock Arlington is an example. Although African-Americans could buy land, Restrictions outside of it caused properties to become smaller and smaller as populations grew, thus leading to unbuildable lots. It seems like we need to look at this in DC around zoning. Are we, are we going to the BZA? BZA is the Board of Zoning Adjustment. Uh, we are not, uh, we are not uh, for Belmont. I, I certainly am for Reno. Um, uh, Belmont is before zoning. Zoning did not, uh, was not enacted in DC until 1920, and I'm not sure when it was in Montgomery County. So uh, in many ways, uh, zoning was a, it was, is, a, is a successful attempt or a successful effort by, um, act by, home, by, by landowners, homeowners, and, and commercial owners uh, to take a lot of the concepts in covenants that were, that were previously contained in covenants because they could get very detailed just like zoning codes and make uh, them a, an issue of state enforcement, the police powers of the state. Um, so... Uh, I, I, I was not aware of, of, of that specific interest, but that specific case of, of, of how the zoning was used there, but it, it doesn't surprise me in any way. It's, there's a lot of, a lot of shenanigans with that. Um, it's also fascinating. I've never heard that before. Yeah. Definitely. And to Megan, Megan asked the second question, yeah. I think that what I'm yeah I think that what I'm suggesting is that the forbidding of people to live in parts of DC causes problems elsewhere that cause long term damage to other parts of DC. Uh, yeah, I completely agree. Um, everything is it, there's there's uh, it's not a neighborhoods are are interconnected at the end of the day they're part of the same metropolitan region and that's one of the things that's always kind of a problem uh, problematic rather with uh, suburbs is that it is all about sort of excluding what you don't want and having the benefits still having the benefits of being close to the city. Um, and it's it's just thing that's it's a, certainly an issue that is a major major through line in urban history. Uh, Christopher asks uh, whether the the development moved to Reno from Belmont to get inside the boundary into the lawful boundary inside the lawful boundary of the district. That's a really great question. Uh, I don't. I it's it's hard to know. I mean, the important thing to remember is that. Um, while in 1906, uh, DC was definitely a better place for African Americans than Maryland, um, I don't know that by the time uh, Zachariah Thomas and Thomas Johnson started work setting up setting up camp there, whether DC was that much better than Maryland. So in 1913, Woodrow Wilson um, 
uh, when Woodrow Wilson came to president, it came, became president in two uh, Democratic, Southern, Southern Democratic uh, uh, houses of Congress uh, controlled the government. They began uh, segregating DC and demoting a lot of, of people. Uh, a lot of the uh, uh, people, and particularly Charles Cuny, was hit with this pretty hard. Uh, his, his life was basically ruined by Woodrow Wilson uh, sort of and, and his agencies squeezing him out of, uh, of his positions in the government. Um, so. We have a little bit more time if anybody has additional questions. We always squeeze them all. So we're going to um, be sending out a link to the um, video that you saw right after this. It will, it will already be live, um, which will be very exciting. And so please share with everyone. And um, uh, we will also send an email to you guys. So anyone who registered for this, will send out an email with the link. Um, uh, thanks, Tim. Yes, Tim. Thank you, Tim. <laughs> and thanks, Megan, for, for putting that uh, link. Oh, and there is the link for the YouTube. Yeah. So we, <laughs> we, appreciate, we have the video that we showed earlier that we kind of, we took our, we, the presentation we were going to do, we, we put that in a video and you can actually uh, share that on YouTube now. So we'd appreciate it if you did, if you, if you thought this was something that people need to, to hear. So. Um, and we have one last slide. We've been working on this for a very long time. So we had a lot of time to think about these guys. Yeah. And a lot of time needing to have drinks Afterwards. after doing research. Um, so we designed, really Neil mostly designed these. He was the bartender. Um, these drinks, um, an homage to the Belmont Syndicate and for me, Maggie Walker. Um, so please take a photo of this if you're interested in making any of them. They're very strong. Yeah, they're all very strong, uh, especially the James Neal. It's a that uh, cherry brandy is fire breather. That's that's why we gave him. He's a he was he was a very strong defender of civil rights and it was not not afraid of did not miss his words. So we gave him the, the free fire. Uh, the Dumas is a little bit more relaxed. <laughs> People yeah. like drinks. All right, everyone's very happy. <laughs> um, so we're just going to put one more time, we're going to put up the information um, for advocacy for the DC archives. Again, the oversight hearing is this Friday morning. So if you want to testify, you can um, email Anita Bond's office, which the email is on here. You can actually call um, and give phone testimony. Um, I'm not how, sure how often people do that, but if you, uh, <laughs> if you use the, the camera uh, to link to the QR code, it will show you the, I think, I don't think this is that phone number. I think this is to, I think no, that's, this that's is the phone number. number. Okay. Um, or you can email them your testimony. You can email them and tell them you want to testify live on virtually on Friday. Um, and if you're, if you're um, interested in this and want to keep in touch and, and know what we're up to and see what's happening with the archives, please sign up for our Substack or follow us on Twitter. Um, and I feel like in the last year since we started doing work with the council on this, um, it really feels like it's having a little bit more momentum. So that's because all of you guys are actually doing this and sending things to council. And so, the more everybody gets involved in this, the more likely it is that these papers will get saved. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us, and and thank you for for taking interest in this topic. I hope that I hope that this is uh, meaningful to you and 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 enriches the lives of all people in DC. Thank you.